Welcome to Facing the Canon. And today, my guest is Rob Lilwar. Rob, that you're here with us today. Thanks. You're a bit of an adventurer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's your uh, book, Cycling Home from Siberia. My word, Siberia is a long way away. When did you get this idea that you would cycle? Well, uh, after I left university, I was a geography teacher and I taught geography for a couple of years to teenagers. And after I'd been teaching for a while, I decided I wanted to go and explore the world and learn some more geography. And I thought I'd do it on my bike. And I initially, I thought maybe I'd set off from England and cycle into the world. Then I thought it would be more fun if I started as far away as possible and rode back. So I flew to Siberia and then cycled home. So prior to that, though, Rob, how, how, were you a cyclist? Um, I'm not the sort of cyclist who puts on my lycra and whizzes around the hills um, on a racing bike. I'm more of a kind of adventurer cyclist, so sometimes in my holidays I've just been off and cycled across the country with a few bags on the bike. So I've done a few mini trips like that before. So in terms of fitness, uh, were you quite fit? Uh, no, I was pretty average. I played a bit of badminton and went for an occasional run. and I. I think I just decided if I'm going away cycling for several years, I will get fit when I start the trip. There's no point like spending all my life cycling before I go cycling. Yeah, but so now you're thinking, right, I'm going to go on a nice long cycle ride. OK, so I mean, most of us, I mean, I've not even cycled around my own village. OK, and you, here's you thinking, oh, I'm going to cycle 30,000 miles. I mean, wh why not? 5,000 miles. What made you think I want to do 30,000 and spend three years doing it? Um, I think initially I wasn't planning on quite such a long trip. I was thinking of about a year, year and a half, so maybe half the distance. And I think I just, I'd done some shorter trips for a month or two, which was one or 2,000 miles. And I just thought it's time to do something really epic. And if I don't do it now, I probably never will. So I thought, right, this is the time to do it. And once I got started, I started adding on all these detours and it got longer and longer. So you decided, Rob, to start uh, in Siberia? Yeah, I decided to start as far away from England as possible on the other side of Asia. And Siberia just seemed like a really epic, kind of interesting place to start the journey. So I flew, took about 18 hours via Moscow to fly to, fly to a city called Magadan in the northeast of Siberia. And then... It was September, so the weather wasn't too bad when I set off. I was with a friend, actually, for the Siberian part of the journey. But then pretty quickly, within the first few weeks, as we cycled inland, the, the snow started to arrive. The temperature dropped very rapidly, and by October, it was kind of properly winter, so it got cold pretty quick. My word. I read in your book, uh, Rob, that you had to cycle 67 miles a day because you, there was an urgency about getting to the uh, Russian border because of your visa. Yeah, 67 miles a day is normally for a kind of on a decent road. It's not actually that difficult to do 67 miles a day. But the roads after we'd gone a little bit into the wilderness turned into these kind of bumpy tracks. It was very slippery. So we we're always falling off. And so we went incredibly slowly. So to cover the 67 miles a day we needed before our visa ran out, um, we were just having to sort of cycle into the night. And it was obviously quite short daylight hours. So yes. it turned into a bit of a kind of race against time and um, so, so what time did you start in the morning um probably about 5 a.m until about 11 at night when we were because basically we knew if we don't do 67 miles today we'll have to do 69 or something tomorrow yes. and we'll just we won't stand a chance so it was kind of ride until you do the distance at that point but cycling 18 hours a day does that is that not uncomfortable yeah it was um unpleasant and yes. horrible but um and there's only one road, isn't there? Was there only one road? Yeah, the, certainly the first few thousand miles in Siberia, there was only one road. It's a very empty, empty place. Obviously, Siberia is the 
one fourteenth of the world's land surface, but not actually that many no. people live there. And the road we were on, the Russians call it the Road of Bones, because it was this road yes. built by the Gulag prisoners in the 30s, and a lot of people died building it. To the, there were a lot of, there's a lot of gold up there, so mm. they built it for the prisoners. And now it's barely used. Some days we'd see, well, some days we didn't see anyone at all. Other, other days we would maybe see one car a day. So it's a very unused road. Right, so give us the journey back. Uh, how, how, after you crossed the border, where did you go and how did you eventually come back? From Siberia, we caught a ferry down to Japan, at which point me and my friend I was with kind of went separate ways after that. And then I cycled through Japan, caught a boat to South Korea, and then from there to China on another ferry, and then down to Shanghai and Hong Kong in China. And then from Hong Kong, I decided to take a a bit of a major detour down to Australia. I wanted to keep heading south, so I was trying to get to Australia, but it was several thousand miles across the sea to Australia, and obviously most people fly there, and there, there are no ferries. Um, and I didn't really want to fly, because it just felt a bit like cheating to suddenly jump on a plane and fly to the next sure. country. So I ended up um, kind of hitchhiking on yachts and fishing boats and cargo ships through the Philippines and Papua New Guinea to get to Australia. So that was quite a big detour. And then uh, from Australia, I went round to Perth in Australia, back up to Singapore, and then home through places like Southeast Asia, Tibet, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Iran, and then Europe. So that was the route. That was the route. Yeah, and that took you that. three years. Three years, yeah. I wasn't cycling every day. I no, was, of course. Um, I tend to cycle quite hard when I was on the road, and then when I got to a big city, I'd often have friends of friends or something would invite me to stay and I'd take a bit of a break and then I'd keep going. So, so you met some fascinating people on your uh, journey. Um, as you reflect back, you know, what, what were the highlights of the, the people that you met that, that left an impression upon you? Yeah, I mean, I met lots of extraordinary and wonderful people. And I think one of the nicest lessons I learned was that there are just lots of very kind people in the world. And almost every week I found, whether it's in Siberia or China or Iran, a total stranger would invite me to stay. They'd see me in their village and they'd see I was on my own and I'd end up um, being invited in. So that happened countless times, really, in the end. So it was a really nice thing to learn, all these lovely people around. Yes. Um, so r just random people would see this this yeah. guy with his bike <laughs> yeah. and find you rather intriguing yep. and welcome you to their home. More or less, yeah. Um, occasionally I probably dropped a hint when I started putting my tent up in the middle of the village and yes. people invited me in and things like that. If I, if, I, um, if I was vulnerable or something, people would often want to look after me. And yeah, there are a number of people really stood out, I think, as just very inspiring people. It was, as a Christian, it was a very interesting trip because quite often when I was stuck and I didn't, I didn't like the look of a town, it didn't look safe for camping. And I, if it was a Christian country, I'd go and knock on the local church. Sometimes that was kind of Orthodox or Catholic or Protestant, whatever it was. And nearly always I'd be invited in. And that was a lovely way to kind of experience this global family of Christians. Amazing. Um, for all our differences, you know, there was this amazing hospitality. Um, and it, yeah, it was a, that was a really nice part of the journey too. How did you communicate with people of different cultures and different languages? Yeah, the trouble was I was every, about every three months I was in a new country and initially I did try to learn Russian, which I was just getting the hang of and then I got to Japan and I thought, ah, I've got to start again and I got yes. a bit lazy after that. So I tended to not spend a lot of time learning the languages after that. I'd learn a few words to be polite, and then I could use a little bit of sign language, so kind of hungry, sleepy, tasty, that kind yes. of thing. And I also had something I called my magic letter, which was a letter which was originally written in English, but before I got to a new country, I would get it translated into the new language. So, for example, just before I got to China, I, I emailed it to a Chinese friend who Yes. emailed it back in Chinese and then when I was in China in a, often in a village surrounded by people who were maybe a bit suspicious they didn't see many foreigners they thought who's this strange guy on a bike and we couldn't communicate and I'd give them this letter and it said something like hello my name is Rob I'm a teacher from England I'm exploring the world I'm having a great time everyone's so friendly especially here in China everyone's so nice um, please help me on my way something like that and it was yes. a kind of introduction and 
when people had read that, they would stop being suspicious and give me a cup of tea or sometimes invite me to stay. So it was a, it was a great letter to have as an introduction when I couldn't communicate. Wow. But during the, the, the three years, um, were there dangerous moments? Yeah, occasionally. Um, I did get robbed twice on the journey, once at gunpoint. Um, I got chased by a bunch of guys with machetes once. Um, occasionally a snake or something I had to steer around in Australia. But I think, although those are the most kind of... My word. So the snakes, was that in the outback in Australia? Well, uh, yeah, just on the open roads. Open you know, they've road. got these long, empty roads with not many cars and the snakes yes. slither out and sunbathe on the warm road. And yes. I think twice I was kind of daydreaming and kind of not really concentrating and I cycled straight over the top of the snake and had to pedal like mad. So, um, so yeah, th I think those are the kind of glamorous dangers of snakes and robbers and things. Sure. But, um, but I, like when you were being robbed, I mean, that must be in a fearful experience. Yeah, that was that was yeah, just upsetting and frightening. And um, did you fear for your life? I, I don't. I I think I found that the most frightening times were usually just before I went somewhere very scary. But when yes. I was somewhere very scary, or very occasionally when there was an actual genuine danger, I think it's all kind of adrenaline, and you don't really. It's not the same sort of fear as, for example, just. The night before I went into Afghanistan, that was the worst bit because you start imagining everything that's going to go wrong and those imaginations are much worse than just pedalling like mad sure. through or even when something really bad was happening, it would, didn't have time to be afraid because it's just sort of shock sensation. But I was just going to say as well, I think the most dangerous thing, although those things are exciting, probably it was the traffic. I had to constantly remind myself is my number one danger because you know, there's quite crazy driving in a lot of places even in Europe you know it's sure everyone drives so fast and so that I think statistically if I was going to get hurt it would have been just knocked off by a car rather than yes um, getting you know mugged or something like that so you know. what were what what were your highlights I think the highlights were usually just after I'd made it across a scary place and I was <laughs> safely on my way to the next place. So when I got on the ferry from uh, Siberia to Japan, that was a great moment. We'd made it through this very cold winter and got out when our visas were still valid. Or just when I was cycling across the Friendship Bridge from Afghanistan to Uzbekistan, obviously a really kind of moment of relief and um, kind of a head full of possibilities that I've actually going to... Um, <laughs> Live to see another day, sort of thing. So, um, yeah, they, yeah, those moments just after a really hard place were a real good feeling. Did, did, you, uh, did you have uh, feelings of loneliness or aloneness? Yeah, probably more aloneness than loneliness. Um, I, I think I was helped a bit on on that front because partly I was often invited in to stay with yes. people. Partly I'm the sort of person who doesn't mind being alone a bit. Um, I enjoy reading, which I think is a massive help when you're stuck in your tent on your own. Um, I could just read a good book. And then, of course, my faith was a huge comfort and uh, source of strength for me because uh, I felt like uh, somebody was with me even if I was completely on my own. So, so during those three years, um, uh, on your own, obviously encountering lots of different people from different cultures, but as you said, you were... Um, leaning on God and praying and uh, you had a Bible with you th and you tried to read a little bit of the Bible every day? Yeah, I tried to, yeah. 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 But w w would you say, as you look back, uh, that you ha also had a spiritual experience? Spiritual experience, I suppose it depends how we define spiritual experience. It wasn't kind of amazing... Um, kind of intense spiritual experiences but as a as a journey I think journeying is quite a spiritual experience it is, itself isn't it? especially maybe if you're on your own and sometimes I, I I thought of the journey as a kind of pilgrimage across yes. the world yes. I suppose and a pilgrimage I suppose is a place where people have often experienced God in in some way even if it's a kind of gradual way rather than a sudden burst of intense experiences so having done this, this a major 
th it was 30,000, how many miles? 30,000? Yeah, a bit more than 30,000, yeah. Yeah. You, you eventually arrived home mm -hmm. um, to your parents. Where yeah. do they, your parents live? In West London. In West London. And then what, you just knocked on the door and said, hi, mum, I'm back. Um, yeah, no, I've given them a bit of warning. Um, I did. I mean, throughout the journey, it's one of these things which w would have been totally different 20 years ago. But every big town I went through, there was in the world pretty much now, there's an internet cafe. So I was always able to sure. loosely stay in touch with home. And um, so my parents, yeah, my parents were expecting me when I got back. So that was really nice. Um, but then the next couple of months after I'd kind of had that initial happiness of getting home was quite difficult just adjusting to being back in a kind of one place normal life figuring yes. out what to do next sort of thing so. and trying to process what your whole pilgrimage and journey was all about yeah exactly yeah you um i read that you learned how to say hello in 21 different languages yeah but don't test me now <laughs> <laughs> i think i well, tell forgotten. me some of them tell me some oh um well Russian is Strasvitya. Yes. And Japanese is Konnichiwa. Um, Chinese is Ni Hao. Who knows? What about in Afghanistan? What did you say there? I think that's Salam. Yes. Um, or Assalamu Alaikum is the, you know, the kind yeah. of Muslim yeah, greeting yeah, yeah, yeah. which kind of works all through the Middle East. So. so having had time now, obviously since then you uh, try to express something of your journey uh, which has become your book, mm. um, and you've had time to think it through and process it. What would you say, what maybe life lessons did you learn from this experience? Often I felt like giving up, especially if I was in a, a dangerous place or about to go into a dangerous place. And um, I think sometimes I, I thought about how I'd feel if I gave up and I came home. And then I think about how will I feel if I keep going and I get to my next kind of goal. Um, and, and I realised how much better I'd feel if I actually got to where I said I was trying to get rather than giving up. And so I think that was one obvious lesson was kind of perseverance yes. and thinking how I'd feel if I give up compared to how I feel if I make it. And that takes quite a bit of um, courage, really, particularly if you're not feeling very well and you've got blisters and your bike's broken and you're really cold, mm. but you somehow kept going. Yeah, and I think just the, the courage thing, I think I appreciated more and more that courage, as a, a saying, isn't there? Courage isn't absence of fear, it's doing something even if you're frightened. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm not a brave person at all. I get very frightened and worried about stuff, but and just kind of making that decision to do it anyway. You're not a um, brave person at all, and you go and cycle 30,000 miles. I think you've got a little bit of bravery there. <laughs> well, I, OK, well, I, I, I feel a lot of fear. It's not yes. like I don't feel fear. Yes. But I suppose on the trip I was learning to... I always said to people I, I, I took calculated risks, so I didn't just go through wherever I felt. I'd do a lot of research, I'd calculate how, you know, how what sort of risks are there in this place um, before I went through a, a dangerous place? And I'd, cause I, I, I suppose I wrestled with that as a Christian. What's our mm. responsibility about going on adventures? Because I think adventuring is fine in many ways, but there's a responsibility as well not to yes. do something too stupid. So I wrestled with that a lot and I, I tried to use my brain and like research yeah. places. I didn't sort of just think, well, hey, I'll be fine because I'm a Christian because I think Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a responsibility there too. So that was a, a kind of something I had to process a lot as I went to. Yeah. Um, which, which country did you enjoy most? I think probably for fun was China. It was just a lot of fun and lovely people, lovely roads, lovely landscapes. Yes. Um, and strangely, some of my favourite memories are of, the really tough places which I didn't enjoy when I was there, like Siberia or Papua New Guinea or Afghanistan, which yes. when I was there, I was just desperately trying to get through them in a way. But now I look back, I've got a lovely, amazing memory. I think I'm so glad I went there. It was a great kind of test and stretched yes. me to my limits. Um, did, you, did you ever get lost? I tended not to get lost when I was going city to city, like yes. going from Kuala Lumpur to Bangkok. It's fairly easy to find Bangkok. But then when I got to Bangkok, I'd get completely lost. So it was in the cities, yes. looking for my friend's house or whatever. I'd 
get totally lost. But between the cities, you can usually just ask someone or look at the map. I had a map usually. Um, and so it was quite easy not to get lost on the way to a city. Mm. Yeah. But so you came home, you kind of uh, tried to process this three year experience, you wrote your book, and uh, was that quite hard to write? Yeah, I found it very hard. I think I, I found it harder than riding the bike, really, in many yes. ways. And it, I think some of those things about not giving up, that kind of that kind of persevering, like on the bike, I had to force myself to go sixty miles a day or whatever. Yes. In the book, I just had to force myself to keep on writing, even when I didn't feel like it. And some days I went very slow, some days faster, and that was a similar sure. sort of experience. Um, but it was a great experience when I finished it. I was really glad I wrote it. And then, uh, but also on the journey, you, you met someone who subsequently became your wife. Yeah, um, that was my favourite um, story from the journey. <laughs> was um, when I was in Hong Kong about yes. one year into the trip, I was trying to look for a boat down to Australia and I got a bit stuck in Hong Kong looking for a boat. So I was there for three months. And a couple of weeks after I arrived, I met this girl who was... Um, girl from Hong Kong, she was a lawyer there and we um, got on very well and we actually started to see each other and it was great. Uh, but then after three months I had to set sail for Australia and she was actually coming to work in England and we decided to try and keep it going long distance and we stayed in touch and occasionally when she had a holiday she came to meet me yes. in cities along the route and then she was still here when I got back and then last year I married her so it was a kind of happy Amazing. end to the story. So how yeah. long into your journey did you meet her? One year in, so one, year. one third of the way in. Yeah, so you said to her, um, her name's Christine, you said, Christine, I, um, I'm cycling, I've just done a year, but I'm going to cycle for another two years. So she didn't think you'd lost it or something? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, she knew, even when we were introduced, she knew I was this crazy cyclist, so... Um, it wasn't like we started going out and then I announced actually I'm in the middle of this bike trip. No. So she knew and I think we both knew it was completely silly what we were doing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so quite... You never, you never dreamt that you'd find a wife on your journey? No, I mean, at the big, I remember when the Russians used to ask me why I was doing it. I got so tired of trying to explain. I used to just say, oh, I'm looking for a good wife. That's why I'm on yes. this bike trip as a joke. And, and they, they laugh. Yeah, they laughed and I just was joking. So I was quite surprised when yes. I did actually find one. You so, did. Yeah. Amazing. So look, you've come back, you're, you're home, you wrote the book, and then you're, um, you're obviously a bit of an adventurer because... You then decided to walk round the M25. When well, when did you get that idea? Yeah, that was um, just earlier this year in a very wintry week, which we had in England, and yes. there was a lot of snow around. And it was actually I did that with a, the friend I cycled through Siberia with, and I think we were both married. We didn't have much time off. I didn't want to go away for three years cycling again. And we thought, well, let's just go on a really little adventure and. We wanted to test two kind of ideas. Firstly, can you have a good adventure just by stepping out of your back door rather than yes. flying to Siberia? And are people in England nice? Because everywhere else in the world, people had invited us in. Right. We thought, will we meet nice people here? Um, so we so we decided to walk a lap of the M25 motorway, and it happened to be this very wintry weather. So it was absolutely amazing for an adventure. It was beautiful. We didn't take a tent. We just took sort of bivy bags with us so we just slept in forests and walked through the fields and so when you say you walk around the m25 obviously you didn't walk around the hard shoulder no didn't walk around no. the hard shoulder so we how just... do you walk around the m25 well just roughly speaking we tried to stay stay very near it in the fields or forests either side of it sometimes we strayed a little bit further away from it and and we did actually meet lots of amazing people i think the english love a sort of slightly crazy adventure and so They'd all say we were completely mad and then uh, give us a cup of tea. And so that happened quite often. We were invited to stay uh, once in somebody's house, just completely randomly. And the guy let us put up our, well, put up our bivy bags in his garden. And people were really nice. So it felt like both of our um, theories were tested. And we did find people were nice here. And you can have an adventure without flying anywhere so yeah how, how many miles is it around the m25 i think it's 120 driving but we probably did more like 180 or something like that 
And so how long did that take you to do? It took a week. Um, so it was quite long days, sort of yes. um, 20 or 30 miles a day. And I think walking is a lot harder than cycling because you've got to carry your stuff, which yes. so kind of impacts your, your feet and knees. And Whereas then climbing over fences and lots things. Lots of fences to climb over and... Yeah, it's 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 brilliant fun. It was it was a really nice little adventure. So you enjoyed that? I did. Yeah. The, apart from my painful blisters, I really enjoyed it. So yeah. go on. What what are your aspirations for the future? Well, me and my wife have now moved mostly to Hong Kong. So we're based there eleven months of the year, and we're setting up a fundraising office for a very cool children's charity called Viva. So yes. that's our new adventure and that really feels like an adventure because fundraising is quite hard work and it uh, it's something we really believe in and I feel like more called to that end of things rather than the on the ground working yes. with children but trying to trying to provide or channel funds towards that work. So And, and on your three year uh, cycling expedition you raised money for charity then? Yeah it was the same charity it's actually. Same for charity. Viva I raised um, funds just through a, a kind of online giving website yes. I, I raised about £20,000 so that was a great project for sure. me to have and occasionally during the cycle trip if I went through a country where Viva was working I would visit some of their projects oh. so that was always inspiring. And the main w focus of Viva is? Viva is the main focus is children at risk so that's street children, orphans, exploited children or any child at risk mostly in the developing world is their focus and they are really trying to help the Christian response to be much more effective towards the children in their midst who are suffering a lot so that would be church programs to look yes. after children better or helping existing projects which may be are struggling um, to do better so it's it's not setting up lots of new projects it's more trying to help what's sure. already happening so it does I'm trying to actually take this scary prospect of setting up a fundraising office and treat it like cycling home from Siberia. So it's an adventure, we have to take yes. a few risks, we have to keep going, we have to, you know, um, try and have a healthy attitude towards it all, that kind of thing. Well, Rob, you're a very intriguing person and I'm, I'm feeling like now, oh goodness, I better get a bike and at least cycle around my village. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even got a bike. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got rid of my bike. In fact, I had one for years and then got rid of it. And uh, it might be time to pick up the bike and uh, take another cycle ride. <laughs> Rob, thank you so much for uh, joining today and just sharing a little bit of your own experience and uh, wish you and your wife, Christine, uh, well for the future um, in all your expeditions and I, I, I've got a feeling there's a few more that will come around. Thanks very much Rob. Thanks so much.